Okay, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining this, this RDA webinar. Uh, we're going to get started shortly. So, firstly, yes, welcome to this webinar on RDA groups and outputs to support data management plans. This webinar is organized by the RDA Secretariat and is part of a series aimed at raising awareness of the Research Data Alliance and its recommendations and outputs. We also want to um, speak to the community about how these outputs can be used and adopted. So firstly, to introduce myself, I'm Daniel Bangert from the Göttingen State and University Library. I'm working for RDA Europe and are part of the RDA Secretariat. And it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, the speakers for this webinar. We're going to hear from Catherine Unsworth at the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization, CSIRO, which is Australia's national science agency. We'll then hear from Peter Nish at the University of Melbourne and Tomasz Mixer at SBA Research in Austria. Peter and Tomasz are two of the co-chairs of RDA's DMP Common Standards Working Group. And then we'll hear from Sam Rust at the Digital Curation Center. And of course, the work presented uh, today is done by a, a broader group of stakeholders and, and community members. I've included the links on the slide here where you can join and actually follow and engage with the work um, as it progresses. The agenda for today is that I'll give a brief overview of um, some work RDA is doing around outreach um, and impact. Then I'll hand over to Catherine to talk about the Exposing DMPs Working Group and some current updates. Then we'll hear from Peter and Tomasz around the DMP Common Standards Working Group, in particular their work on machine actionable DMPs. Sam will talk about plans uh, to adopt this, this standard, and then hopefully we'll have around 20 minutes to take questions from the audience. So as we go along, please post questions in the question box, and then we'll review and take those uh, as we go. Uh, sorry, we'll take those at the end, rather. So a reminder that RDA's mission is to build the social and technical bridges that enable open sharing and reuse of data. And its associated mission is that of researchers and innovators openly sharing data across technologies, disciplines and countries to address the grand challenges of society. Bridging these the, both the social and the technical requires input from diverse representatives across the research landscape to develop multi-level solutions to data management issues through the life cycle. And we can see some of the topics and issues being tackled through RDA's interest and working groups, which now number over 100. This approach and these groups then produce outputs that cover areas uh, such as data management, data collection, data description, processes to identify, store and preserve, to disseminate, link and find, and topics of policy, compliance and capacity. There are now over 30 RDA recommendations and outputs emerging from those groups, which you can find at the link shown on the screen. To take a life cycle view of research data, RDA's recommendations and outputs can be implemented at each stage to enhance the quality, transparency, interoperability and persistence of data. And today we'll look at groups and outputs related to this data management planning phase and the work on active DMPs in particular. So to close this introduction, I just want to point out three ways to engage further with RDA and its recommendations and outputs. One of these is to look at the adoption stories, which are the experiences of 
institutions and organizations that have uh, implemented some of these RDA recommendations and outputs. You can read them at the link uh, shown on the screen. And we're also encouraging those who have used RDA outputs to submit stories of their own. Uh, so please get in touch with us. You can submit a story via a web form and we can talk to you about publishing that story. Another opportunity is a special issue of the CoData Data Science Journal, which has an issue around uh, RDA results. There are some papers already available and there is um, the ability to cover APCs for further articles in this special collection. And finally, I would like to invite you to our RDA plenary meetings. The next one is in Helsinki towards the end of October. And recently announced, uh, the following one will be in Melbourne, Australia uh, around mid-March next year. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Catherine Unsworth, who will talk about the Exposing DMPs Working Group. And thanks, Daniel. Over to you, Catherine. Okay. Hmm. Show my screen. Sorry, I'm just trying to get it to. Now, are you seeing the right screen there? Yes. Thank you. That's great. Good. Hello, everybody. Um, from sunny but cold Melbourne, um, I've got a little arrow showing you where I'm situated. And um, thanks, Daniel, for the introduction today, too. So I better get scooting on because I've got a lot of um, slides with little time to talk about them. So um, I just thought I'd um, pay homage to my fellow working group chairs, Angus White, Natalie Myers, Fiona Murphy, and Mari Christine Giacomo Pupo, and also our 80 plus um, members, which is a nice size. Um, we have a, I guess, a simple premise to improve data management practice. Um, DMP should be shared at appropriate stages in the research life cycle. Um, but this isn't actually, um, a, it might be a, a simple premise, but it's not an actual um, non-trivial task to achieve. There are lots of questions. Um, what if there are sensitive research data or other sensitive aspects surrounding a project that inhibit the sharing of um, DMPs? Uh, when is the right time to expose DMP content, content pre-award, mid-project, po post-project? And also the mechanisms, what, what are those that exist or can be built into workflows that easily expose DMP content in human and machine readable formats in the most appropriate ways? So our um, working group has basically set out to try and see if we can answer those sorts of questions. And our work has been broken up into three uh, phases, the use case consultation, um, use case catalogue and the reference model section, which I'll talk about. Uh, these use cases came from our, from our working group's analysis of the DMP Common Standards Working Group user story classification work. Um, the user stories were collected and classified, having been submitted by uh, members of the e-research community and can be found on the Common Standards GitHub site as well. So we thank them for that work because that helped us um, greatly. So we, we took these uh, user stories and we coded um, these the stories based on the problem that they highlighted or the opportunity gained they, that they highlighted from exposing DMPs, which we then um, surfaced into the use cases you see on the slide now. And I won't go into them. I just might give you one example, say for the publication one and a matching user story. So as a funder, I want to ensure that studies I fund use DMPs to provide contextual information that helps others reproduce or replicate the results. So that's just a kind of indication how we, we've sort of matched each of the uh, user stories to one of these use cases. And we've then gone on to use those use cases in the survey. And this was one of the questions we asked, which of the following purposes for sharing DMPs have value in your opinion? And transparency as a use case came out as um, the, 
the you know, the most chosen. Remembering too that people could choose more than one of these use cases. But when I look at transparency, I actually feel that that use case um, is enabled by the remaining use cases. So deposition of um, DMPs to a repository, integrating DMPs in research workflows and stuff like that. They're all around um, creating more transparency in research. And I put an arrow in there for uh, the none, um, don't wish to expose the DMP because we didn't get any, any um, clicks on that particular answer. So the survey, um, you can find the survey instrument and the data, uh, they're both on the Research Data Alliance uh, website, um, on our web, web pages, the Exposing DMPs web pages, and you can get to them via these links, which I think the, the um, PowerPoints will probably be circulated. We had 571 responses, 409 of those were complete responses. And our survey was to gauge user needs and motivations for exposing DMPs as well as perceived risks and undesirable impacts. The survey results contribute to a better understanding of expectations related to sharing and publishing the content of data management plans. And I'm pulling out a, a couple of the questions that we, uh, a couple of other questions that we asked in the survey, just to give you a little bit of a taste of what we did um, try and delve into with our participants. So please indicate your role related, related to data management plans and research data management. Now you can see there that a good number of people, well the biggest, largest chunk of people were researchers and these are self-identified obviously and again they could choose more than one of these um, alternatives. But I also thought that pulling out what people put in as other that they didn't think fitted into these categories. And um, some of them like research ethics and policy advisors and trainers and educators, you know, are other people who are um, involved with using DMPs in, in various certain ways. Then the next question that I'd like to, to show you was what do you see as the potential positive impacts from exposing DMPs? And transparency came um, out trumps again with exemplars coming um, in second. And to better evaluate cost of data management was, was the third largest respondent um, response. And I find that really interesting. And I think it's a use case that we really need to um, pay a little bit of attention to. And again, I've pulled out um, some of the qualitative data around other that people identified, such as reproducibility, data standards um, as an educative tool and so on that you can read there. Uh, another question was, what do you see as the potential negative impacts of exposing DMPs? And obviously sensitive information or sensitive data is, is the biggest chunk there. And getting scooped again is a, another um, worry, I guess, for particularly for researchers. And then I pulled out some other things from other. Um, so time consuming, uh, can, you know, maybe impacting on competitive advantage, administrative burden and plagiarism and so on. And then what would you, um, be your preferred mechanism or method for publishing DMPs? And the most uh, responses were for general institutional repository with the DMP catalogue coming in second there. And it's interesting, there was a note in, um, the qualitative data there that said DMP tool list public DMPs already basically, add a DOI and more search to that and it's good to go. So um, that was an inter interesting response. And you know there are other DMP catalogues coming to the fore now too, such as the Lieber one. And finally, from the survey, when are the optimal points within the research life cycle for a DMP to be exposed? And I'll just pick out best and I guess worst. So for best, it was end of project, best time, and at the time of related publication release came in second. And for the worst times, it was project proposal time or pre-award and never. So never is not a good time. So that's really encouraging as well. It means that people think that they should be, um, certainly parts thereof, DMPs at least should be exposed at some point. And uh, we're currently in the process of doing some interviews. Uh, so that's work in progress. And these are the stakeholder um, groups that we have started interviewing and will continue to interview um, various people from each of those groups. And these are the same um, stakeholder groups that the DMP Common Standards Working Group identified as well. 
And then our case studies will obviously uh, be pulled together and written up based on the, the, uh, the data that we get out of the surveys and, and more importantly from the, the follow-up interviews as well. Uh, so they're still to come. And our recommendations, we're hoping to have recommendations uh, ready by the 14th plenary. Um, if not though, we'll, we'll look to provide those in, in Australia when it's um, plenary 15 in Australia and we'll probably be looking at also wrapping up the working group at that point. So our anticipated outcomes are a reference model including alternative strategies for exposing plans to best serve community interests in meeting very importantly the FAIR principles and based on shared experience of early adopters in test implementation. So that's it from me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. I'll switch over to, to Peter. Um, and just a reminder to everyone, uh, if you have questions along the way, please pop them in the question box. Uh, also noting who the question is directed to and we'll take them uh, in the Q&A. So, Peter. Okay, thanks, Daniel. Uh, can you hear me, Arash? Yes. Yep, great. So I'll just introduce the section that we're talking about. Um, I'll introduce our um, machine actionable DMP group, which is the common standards group, uh, along with uh, Tomasz Mixer, who will speak after me with more details about the uh, outputs that we're developing. And Paul Walk is the other co-chair, but as Catherine mentioned, this is the work of many, many people who belong to the group and the wider community. So today I'll just um, talk about why we actually need this, like what it is uh, in terms of what is a machine actionable DMP, uh, what are the key concepts in the model, how to interpret and examples and settings of how it can be used. So the motivation is, um, you know, current DMPs were developed very much around um, being able to submit information to funders, um, very good um, for creating a PDF that is modelled around questions and answers, but uh, we wanted to be able to pull out the information contained in there. So we want to be able to mark up or create a machine actionable DMP that makes use of well-known vocabularies and um, create new vocabularies only if we need them, but um, building on common knowledge as much as we can, but um, using the principle that we want this to be broadly applicable. So our working group launched in October 2017. Uh, this was a result of a consultation from the active DMPs interest group. Um, the idea is to focus on what is actually needed for machine actionable DMP. So part of that was, um, you know, um, as well as the exposing DMP group, which Catherine's talked about, uh, there was seen as a need for a common model um, and from that um, a way of transferring data and information between systems. So we have over 100 members from all content, continents, um, people who build DMP tools, um, they're also part of the group and have been widely consulted. Uh, the paper here links to a workshop that um, was the sort of generation of some of the ideas which took place at the IDCC in 2017. And that gives a lot of the background to um, the work that's been done. So up until now, um, Catherine mentioned the user story. So that was our first consultation. And that was really to define the scope of machine actionable DMPs. So who were the stakeholders? Uh, where, where were things happening? At what stage of the research process were they happening? We then um, had a second consultation, which dived deeper into um, those stories and trying to identify specific models that were already in existence and specific requirements that might might have might be needed out of the model and to also try and um, group those thematically and conceptually. Um, from that, uh, we had a period of um, doing some proof of concepts, again, to kind of test um, 
how how these things might happen, how it might actually be used practically to automate some tasks in um, the DMP space, and also some business process uh, notation to uh, clearly identify systems and the stakeholders involved. So from that, we then uh, went on to develop a common model. And um, I think I will hand over to Tomash at this point, and he will be able to fill in more of the details about the actual model. Great, thanks, Peter. And I'll switch to Tomash. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about the, the model in the next 15, 20 slides. So let's jump directly into the, the standard we have. So this is how it looks like. Uh, you can see uh, many entities, but I think it's like around 10 connected by different arrows. I'm going to briefly talk about each part of the model here. So what you can see in this, in this slide is that we have the upper part of our um, model which is which is here and these entities are related to the DMP. The lower parts are focused on describing the data sets that the DMP describes. Let me just show in detail. So the, the upper part, the DMP, this is our central element and this is the place where you collect information about um, uh, the DMP, for example a title description, uh, what is the language of the DMP and some metadata like when the DMP was created or modified. We, we are using a lot of uh, dates basically to indicate what is the version of the, of the DMP. We are not using any states like um, final or midterm, but basically we are increasing a date um, to show that the certain DMP is a follow-up for a previous one. Then in the model, you can see also a part which is related to projects and, and, and funding. And as you can see in our connections on the arrow, there is always a number, zero and a star, zero star, or in other cases, one. This is a so-called cardinality, and this tells us whether the given element is obligatory or optional. In this case of the project, the cardinality is zero to many, and it means that for some of the DMPs, it may be necessary to refer to a project, while for others, they can exist without any specific project. And again, the same is for the funding. Some projects may be, for example, internal projects run at the university. I don't know, for example, a, a PhD thesis, and they don't necessarily have to be connected to any funding. But in case you are creating a DMP for a funded project, then there is an, a possibility to add information about the grant ID, funder ID, and the status, whether it was funded or not. Uh, the reason for doing this in such a flexible way is that basically there are different requirements around the world, and we have to be able with our standard to incorporate all the needs. Uh, another recommendation we received by doing the community discussion was that uh, usually when you look for a DMP and when you're looking for a, a, for a contact person, this has to be easy to get. So that's why we have here an entity providing an, um, uh, details about the person you want to uh, contact if you have questions about the DMP. This is obligatory for every DMP and this is minimal in a sense that we need the name, the email and, and uh, identifier which can be for example an ORCID. In cases, when you want to um, list more people involved in data management, we have created an entity data management staff. So here you can name all the data manager, managers, um, IT operators, people who are cleaning the data and so on. But as you can see, the cardinality is zero to many, which means you can, but you don't have to. In case of contact, there always have to be one contact person for a DMP. And the last part, which is, uh, which is about the, uh, at the level of a DMP, is the cost. Uh, you can provide information about the costs of data management. And in this case, you are providing uh, the title and the description and, uh, and, the, and the value here. So basically, you can say that storage is costing 20,000 euros, and we are using a dictionary, which is a, 
based on the ISO standard to indicate what the currency is. But again, costs part is optional. Not, not in all uh, cases this is necessary. This is, the, this is what I discussed is this upper part of the, of the model. And now let's go to the lower part, uh, which is the data set. So here is the connection to, to DMP. Uh, and this part describes the data, the specific, specific data sets we, we have, we want to describe in our research. And we have borrowed the, um, the structure from the W3C recommendation uh, DCAT. Uh, and this is also similar to, to schema.org approach. So basically we talk about two classes. We have a data set and the distribution. And the data set describes a logical entity. So a logical data set. In this case, it can be, for example, a collection of files. It can be something generated like, for example, input data, output data, temporary data. It can be source code. In cases, if you want to be very fine granular, it can be even a single file. But we also know that in many cases, people rather prefer to abstract more and say my, my data I generate in an experiment or all my sensor data. And this class is capable to model such situations. In an edge case, you can even have one data set for the whole DMP. But these are the details. I'm happy to, to explain that more. But the message is data set is not making you list all specific files. And for a data set, we have the obligatory fields like the title of a data set and, uh, and type based on the core dictionary. This is Confederation of Open Access Repositories. They have issued a, a, a type dictionary. Um, and each data set can have an identifier, for example, a, a DOI, a language in, it, in which you can, uh, in which it is uh, described, uh, some keywords, of course. And obligatory part, which is important in, in um, terms of um, GDPR in Europe, but also in other countries, in what you're allowed to do with data, is whether there is personal data and sensitive data. And then we are using an enumeration so people can um, tell us if it's sensitive or not, or they don't know. So we don't have any unanswered fields here. And we have uh, two fields here, which are strings, which are necessary because uh, many funders want uh, people to describe uh, in a human readable way how they are going to handle preservation and how they're going to make quality assurance versioning and so on. And these are things we are not able to make machine actionable. There is still human nar narrative needed. Uh, and these are the fields where this information can be put. Okay, let's now move on to the distribution. So what's the difference between distribution and data set? As I said, data set can be a, a generic um, description saying, for example, source code. Distribution specifies where the data set is located and what it actually is. And for this reason, we have, we have fields like format and byte size. So I can say, for example, that I'm going to collect sensor data as a data set. And then in the distribution, I specify that actually my sensor data will be CSV files, which will be in total one gigabyte size. And you can access them from uh, Zenodo. And they are published in an open access. And then they will be available for the next 10 years. So here we provide more details on the, uh, on the, um, uh, on the files themselves. And uh, we can also assign a license. And license is using an URI to point to a specific license document. So for example, if I'm going to publish them using CC BY license, here would be an URL for the uh, CC BY and the starting date from when the license is active. So if we set a date in the future, it means that there is an embargo period over a time. And then from, for example, 2021, this data set, this distribution will be available using this license. And finally, we have a host. This uh, is all to provide information on the quality of service of, on, about the place where the data is kept. So as I gave the example that we are going to keep sensor data on the nodo, and if our funder wants to know what is, for example, the backup type, or if there is a support for versioning, then uh, we can provide automatically also these um, uh, fields. 
Uh, we have taken all of these fields basically from the uh, data side, from the referee data repository, which uh, is a repository for, for um, which is a registry of repositories. Good, let's move on. Uh, and the last part of the model are information about the uh, security and privacy, technical resources and metadata. And uh, as you can see, we don't have, for example, many fields for metadata. This is because we are not going to copy metadata of a data set. So, for example, we are not going to, if, you, if, if we have a collection of JPEG images, we are not going to include here what is the resolution or things like this, no. Here, we just point to a, to a standard that is used uh, to describe the files. So if I have, for example, a, a, set, a collection of, of documents and I have metadata created for them using Dublin Core, I will here only mention that I'm using Dublin Core and that's all. We're not copying, we're not copying data from systems where it exists anyway. Same for technical resources, what kind of hardware, software we need to basically uh, create, maintain the data set. And the same is about the security and privacy. Uh, security and privacy is just a place to lead all potential problems, all potential requirements to ensure, for example, an isolated location. It's, it, it's impossible for us to come up with a set of fields that will be machine actionable, that would describe all kinds of security and privacy threats. There is a lot of research and ontologies of how to model security and privacy um, uh, challenges. This hasn't been solved yet. And this is where our group also has to draw a clear border in case somebody wants in the future come up with a taxonomy or, or, or more fields they can. For us, in view of the data management plans, it's just sufficient to be able to know where to look for any information about any limitations or challenges on that. Uh, now, some more information about uh, where to look, where to read about our, our standards. We have created GitHub pages, and you can see here a link in the bottom to a place where you can find the full specification of the model. So we always have a, a name of a field, short description, type, so whether it's a, it's a value from a vocabulary or if it's a string, if it's obligatory or not. So in this case, zero or one means optional, exactly one means obligatory, and we provide some example values. Uh, we have also created frequently asked questions, uh, and there you can, for example, uh, read again what is the difference between data set and distribution, how versioning works, and things like this. So I recommend you go to our, our GitHub repository even if you don't know anything about Git and GitHub, no worries. This is just like a website and you can find all the information you need. Uh, we have also collected uh, links uh, to all our models, consultations, uh, plenty of prototypes. So please go there and you can uh, find software you can play with. You can find reports from previous workshop. You can find some of our papers. Please go and, and, and check that. And we have also created some examples of um, uh, machine actionable data management plans to basically provide you uh, examples in JSON of how such a MADMP would look like that follows our uh, standard. We have also a JSON schema. So in case you create your own uh, MADMP, you can validate it against the schema. And for all the people who are interested in ontologies and doing maybe some more follow-up research, we also have an old version uh, of, our, of our standard. So uh, here is an example of one of these examples. Uh, so you can see that in JSON, we have here a, a DMP, an entity, uh, and this is a funded DMP. Uh, a, a description says it's an example of a DMP, creation date, modification date, and then the contact, which is obligatory. So the first and last name, the email address of a person to contact, and then we have an identifier. Identifier for a person is ORCID ID. And here we have an identifier type that tells basically a machine how to, how to parse it, that this is an HTTPS uh, plus the ORCID number, not just the pure ORCID number. And information that this um, DMP has no uh, ethical issues, so you can actually uh, use the data without any problems. Uh, and the second part is describing the project, 
so the title of the project, when the project starts and ends. All other information about the project may exist in other systems. We don't copy it here. We found out that only these two are relevant for us to automate uh, certain things in a DMPs. And then information about the funder. So in this case, we, have a, we are using the FundRef registry. And this is a number of one of the Austrian funders from the FundRef registry. And here we have a grant number, which is usually a custom one uh, issued by a specific funder. And we know that the status of the project is funded. And then there will be a, a remaining part of a DMP, but uh, in this example, it's not specified. Uh, just uh, two more words about the standard itself and how to understand the cardinalities we have. So you have to keep in mind that this standard is a, a technical standard, which means that we had to relax the constraints, like in the example that DMP can relate to a project, but doesn't have to. In cases when your funder, your institution says that DMP always created for a project, you can of course make it happen, but this is a constraint you are implementing at your institution, in your tool, and let's say on a business level. So there is no problem to make these constraints stronger and at the same time remain compliant with the standard. We didn't want to tell the world uh, what is the right way to do it. We wanted to provide a technical standard for interoperability. Business constraints can be introduced at, at, uh, uh, where, whenever needed. Uh, another comment about the standard is that uh, we don't uh, see the standard as a way to build your own systems, but rather as a way to exchange information between systems. So. All I, everything I have, I have said uh, is, is necessary when you want, for example, inform a repository uh, from a DMP tool. In case you want to build your own DMP tool, your own DMP system, which schema is, uh, is using our standard, that's also perfectly fine. But if you already have DMP tools or other tools which are doing anything with, with data management and they have different schemas, it doesn't mean you have to throw them away. It means you can do some mappings. You can find a way to express your information following our standard to make all the systems interoperable. And for this reason, we are also evading in the standard meta fields. So for example, we don't have a, a state of a DMP saying final because final can mean something different um, to a researcher, something different to IT support and something different in, in, a, in, a, in a system of, 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 uh, of another university to which you would set the DMP. So we focused really on modeling data and information and not providing such ambiguous meta fields. Okay, this is all about the, about the model itself. Now I have like three, four more slides um, in which I want to give you some ideas of how you could use the, the standard in your uh, settings. So one of the examples is to uh, build the research data management infrastructure. And here I'm going to talk about the small project, small big project. We are running at the Technical University in, in Vienna in Austria. And we basically assume that uh, DMPs are not only for funders. Of course, they are very important. They are driving the need for the DMPs, but we have to create incentives and benefits for researchers to actually write a good DMP. And the way to convince the uh, researchers to actually write good DMPs is to tell them that this will make them have less work when by providing the information to a DMP, we would be able to automate some of the tasks and we would be able to uh, automate the tasks if we use the information. So for example, if the funder wants a researcher to provide a list of DOIs by the end of the project, and if the university for internal statistics also wants to know about all the DOIs of publications the researcher had, we would like to ask only once about it. And this would be a clear benefit for a, for a researcher not to provide this twice. I know it's a very naive and very simple example, but this is already a step in the right direction. And to, to be able to automate such tasks, we see the DMP as the glue between different systems. So in the figure at the side of the slide, you can see that we have a, a DMP as a central element and we are able 
to get some information about data from you know, GitHub or Zenodo. We are also able to uh, get quality of service from uh, repository, repository registries. We are able to integrate with uh, um, uh, university systems. And this is basically all to make uh, getting data in and out from the systems easier. And DMP is a place that can inform decisions. I have it described here in the, in the, in the diagram. So the way we, we see MADMPs to be efficiently used in the LDM infrastructure is that basically a researcher is creating a DMP using an MADMP tool, whatever that is. This is still open what, what the tool would be. And research support can already help the researcher by providing uh, guidance, but also the DMP tool can prefill some of the informations automatically. So very often, researchers are asking okay so what is the license we should use and research support is giving a default answer so if you don't have any constraints you can use cc by this tool can actually fill this information already in and um, and there is no need to make the interaction to talk these two guys uh, between each other then we can also pull information from existing uh, systems of the university to um, get more information so from the trees from the project database and then we create a, a data management plan, which is machine actionable. And unfortunately, some of the funders still require DMPs to be human readable. They still want them to be a, a template. For example, in Europe, Science Europe has a template, and this has to follow their recommendations. It has to even have a look and feel of their template. It is possible to generate, we have some prototypes, human readable DMPs from the machine actionable one, and then submit them to funders. But we are also able to reuse the information from MADMPs to trigger uh, actions in systems at the university. So, for example, we can book storage, we can um, fill out metadata when data is being uploaded to a repository, and so on. So, from this machine actionable representation of information, we can either derive the human readable version or further support processing in the systems of the university. Uh, when it comes to prefilling the information in DMPs, we are talking about the use case when you have the MADMP like described in here, and you're getting something that looks uh, that as if it was written by, by a human. Uh, this uh, supports a situation that there is no blank page syndrome. So it's easier for our researchers to have found, found out when you give them something prefilled with, with data and we try to, uh, we ask them, please tell us if this is wrong or not. So, for example, we suggest a repository of our university. If they don't agree or if they have special needs, they can edit the information. But in case uh, they, this is not the case, they just have a, a ready-made uh, DMP. Uh, another example we have is uh, to, sub to, to make the upload uh, to repositories easier. So, again, from a DMP, we can describe, for example, that there are four data sets. And based on this information at DMP, we can configure a space. In this example, we made this um, in Dataverse. We can create four data sets in Dataverse with uh, filled out metadata, who is the owner, what is the license. This is all information from the DMP. And then uh, the only thing that the researcher has to do is to upload the actual files, the actual data, but everything, the, the whole structure of the of the repository uh, project was set up based on information from MADMP. And this really simplifies uh, a lot of work for the researchers. And in return, we can also export the information from a repository. When, for example, uh, a data set was published and the DO was as DOI was assigned, this can automatically flow into the DMP so that the researcher doesn't even have to bother about reporting what is the DOI number for my publication or for my data set because this was automatically saved into a DMP. You can have a look here. We have some screencasts of, of how this could be done, implemented for Dataverse without changing the, the, the structure of Dataverse repository. Of course, this would work for any other repository system. And this is the part where we would like to ask you all to, um, to help us to contribute to the standard. There are many other uh, stakeholders uh, who can benefit from automation, who can benefit from machine actionable DMPs. 
Uh, in this presentation, I have focused mostly on, on, on researchers and funders, but uh, IT operators, uh, management, policy makers, so whoever you, you, you find um, uh, that this is important, you can, you can do that. Um, I'm also uh, providing here a link to this um, document where we have described like 10 use cases that um, show how we can automate certain things and which stakeholders are included in this automation. We did it for the Technical University. I'm sure this, uh, these use cases are also relevant or similar in, in other uh, universities. And it's always important to articulate the, the benefit for each of the stakeholders. And we also tried to do that with this diagram. You can find all the information under this DOI. Um, and that's basically all from my side for today. So just for, for, for conclusions, I would like to ask you to, to visit our GitHub repository to read more about the standard. Sign up to our group if you want to be informed about the developments and uh, new pilots and new adoptions. And uh, please spread the word and, and implement your model. And in case you have any questions, you can ask us now. Uh, so uh, when there will be the Q&A or, or just drop us an email, we are always very happy to, to, to answer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tomas. So we'll switch to our last presenter, Sam Rust from the DCC, who will give the tool provider perspective. Over to you, Sam. Hi, can you all hear me? Yes. All right, thanks, Daniel. Um, so I'm going to be going over implementing DM, or machine actionable DMPs in DMP Online. Um, DMP Online is using the open source uh, DMP roadmap code base. So this actually applies across uh, a wide number of tools once we implement it, because it'll go into that um, code base. Uh, a little bit about me. I'm a systems developer from the Digital Curation Center. I've been working on DMP online for about uh, three years now. Uh, so having just looked at the machine actionable DMP model, it's worth uh, a quick look at the DMP roadmap model, which is similar to what Tomas was saying about the, uh, the older kind of question and uh, free text answer style um, DMP model. Another thing to, to note about this is we don't have a concept of a data set uh, formally in the model there, and uh, that's a reasonably important part of the machine actual DMP model. So we're trying to target a minimal DMP here. Uh, having a quick look at the objects that are required, uh, we can look at the uh, example minimal DMP here. The, we can have a title, uh, all the other fields that we went over there, and then a couple of placeholder fields from the data set. Uh, DMP on, or DMP roadmap already has a lot of this information, so we can grab the, the plans title from our database, we can grab the uh, plans description um, and map those over onto the DMP. Creation and modification dates are just being tracked uh, by default. And then we can abstract the language from the plans owner because uh, we don't have a language attached to the plan, but that's a relatively easy mapping. Uh, and for the contact, we can uh, use the plans owner again, uh, and the plans owner is ORCID ID. Um, one of the limitations we have here with the ORCID ID is we have about 38,000 users on DMP online, and only 2,041 of them have ORCID IDs hooked up, so we'll need to drive uh, that sort of an integration of those identifiers onto the users. Um, so if we make a couple more assumptions here, we can actually get a lot closer to a minimal DMP. Uh, starting with those data sets, we don't currently have a concept, so let's assume that edge case that was mentioned earlier, that uh, all of the answers are going to correspond to one single data set. Uh, we'll take a title from the plans title, uh, we can take the most generic type available to us, which is data set, and then for sensitive and personal data, we can safely set these to unknown. Uh, on the DMP, we'll need to set the ethical issues exist uh, to unknown. Uh, comparing this back to the minimal DMP, we're basically there. We have all of the required fields to have like a valid machine actionable DMP, uh, but we're not capturing that much information yet that came from the original uh, template style data management plan. So can we do better with the existing data? Uh, one of the integral 
parts of the roadmap database is the themes. And themes are basically just a way that we tag the questions with guidance by saying that they correspond to one of these uh, themes here on the right. Some of them actually map quite well to the string fields on the machine actionable DMPs. So that'll be things like data description, uh, mapping onto the data sets description, the ethics and privacy, mapping onto the DMPs ethical issues description field. Um, but we quickly get into gray areas here should ethics and privacy also match, map onto the privacy and security object? Um, so the approach here would be to try and collect the uh, answers to questions with specific themes, uh, concatenate those, add separators uh, if the cardinality only allows us to have one description on there, or if we're allowed to have, for example, multiple descriptions or multiple of those security and privacy objects, we can add each one separately. Uh, there's another question about whether we should just add the answer or the question text as well, because the answers would lose context without the questions. Um, and there's the issue that we mentioned above of the ambiguous themes. Um, so let's try and improve the data on the themes. We can adjust the roadmap themes to more closely align to the machine actual DMP fields uh, and the objects there. So for example, we could split ethics and privacy up into two. We can add a data quality theme. Um, this would make it a lot easier for us to correspond the existing free text answers that uh, the DMP roadmap project's generating to the string fields that are in the machine actual DMPs and try and get as much of that information um, that's useful into the DMP. Another one that we could do is uh, we can add fields. So you may have noticed that I completely ignored the project and funder uh, objects from earlier. Um, it's because we don't have a start and an end date that we're tracking for the plans, and we are also not tracking uh, the correct uh, identifiers on the funders or the, the formal grant IDs uh, or the funding status with the correct controlled vocabulary. But those are all relatively small, easy things to change to bring our database in line with integrating with the standard. So there's quite a few of these kind of controlled vocabulary issues that the DMP roadmap code doesn't have a concept of. Things like the currency code or uh, DM staff contributor types. Um, and so one way to get around this is we just need to pull in that information and then display it to the user so that they can select from the controlled vocabulary. Um, so this would imply that we're going to change up our question formats. So we're not just asking the free text uh, unstructured questions, but we wanna ask a slightly more structured question because we know what kind of data we're trying to generate at the end. Uh, so this would be things like a, a cost question, um, could fill in the ISO format and the uh, have a specific numerical amount field. Um, and when tagged with the budget theme, we can use that to say that this is uh, the cost attribute of the machine actual DMP. Uh, a simple yes, no Boolean question uh, for all of the exist or yes, no unknown categories. Uh, while we have the ability to add a multi-select box with the options of yes or no, uh, having it formalized into a specific type of question would mean that we can say definitively which answer is yes and which answer is no and map that into our export. Um, things like the staff, we're gonna need to have more ORCID IDs in our system, but allowing then users to select the contributor type from the list and to choose the ORCID IDs of the other contributors on their DMP would let us really easily map then from that question type into the DM staff. Uh, and finally, the metadata we can restrict to a controlled vocabulary to allow the saving of an identifier. Uh, so we've actually done this work on the uh, metadata standards. Uh, we implemented a question where it pulls in from the RDA metadata standards uh, API. It categorizes that uh, with subjects and subsubjects and allows the user to sort that and then add one or more standards uh, to their project using this type of question. And one of the nice things about the way we've done this is that the back end, how we're storing this kind of more complex information than simply text is extensible. So that would let us implement all of the other question types in the same kind of way without too much hassle. So one of the big remaining questions that we have at this point is data sets. 
a large assumption we made uh, at the beginning was that all the questions are answered about one data set. So this is needed for our current data model because we don't explicitly break those out and we don't have themes related to answering what your multiple data sets might be. Um, but to properly support the standard, we would want to be able to express those. The DMP Obidor team has actually, uh, they're uh, another fork of the DMP Roadmap project. They've piloted functionality to support answers for multiple defined data sets. Um, and the code's actually on that branch there. And an upshot to the way that this is implemented is it would keep all the question and theme mapping logic the same, and we would just map that across the multiple data set objects. Uh, so finally, a uh, small note on putting this all together. I uh, hacked together a little demo to try and get an uh, example uh, minimal DMP out of DMP online. So there's the kind of the mapping logic on the right hand and then the display logic on the left. And then if I can continue to present over here, uh, querying our database, I can send off a request and I get a minimal machine actual DMP um, from what I have. So that's all from me. Excellent, thank you, Sam. So I'll just switch the screen again. Thanks. All right, thank you very much to all our presenters. Um, we only have a few minutes left We've tried to answer a couple of the questions that came up um, already. I think, so there was a question around using DC terms from uh, Joachim and I've pasted something from uh, Tomasz in there. Um, if you'd like more details, I think it would be um, best to contact the group chairs directly. In terms of the use by uh, DMP tool providers, we've heard from Sam and there are some adoption plans, but this is something I'm sure the group chairs and IDA would be interested to hear in terms of the, the cases of adoption that might be coming up and any plans to implement the standards that were described uh, today. There's a couple of questions. So there's one from Arena, more European. Do you work with Science Europe? They publish some guidelines and would be Good to have same or similar fields. Uh, we have contacts with people who are participating in the uh, Science Europe meetings. Uh, we know we cannot develop the standards in vain. So we have been talking, for example, to the Austrian funder presenting all our ideas and we incorporated the feedback uh, from them in, in our model, for example, to have some of the fields which require, which are human readable. So basically the strings, so that not everything is just a field, which is, I know, a format or a byte size, but we, where we can provide the, provide the narrative. Thanks. And one more, is there a reference implementation of the M MADMP, uh, for instance, a Python package? Uh, there is a, this, 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 this is a standard, so basically this is a, a data model, so we are providing a, a description of the standard, we are providing examples, we have a JSON schema, so in case you are creating your own DMP, you can uh, check if it complies by running it against the, the schema. Okay, and one final one there, do you have a template that can be used by a university to come up with a DMP for the institution? This is not what we are doing here. Our model is independent of any kind of template. So whatever template you have, our goal is that you should be able to express the information in our model to support exchange information between the systems. So just okay. like Sam was presenting, the DMP online, which is a generic tool allowing you to basically create a, a DMP using any template, is going to export information using the, the model. So this is a setting. The model is not prescribing what questions you ask to people. Great. So thank you all. Unfortunately, we have to close the webinar there, but we really appreciate you all joining. And the slides and recordings recording will be made available. So you'll see those coming out shortly. 
So thank you all again. Um, please engage with the RDA community and this work around DMPs and do follow this work uh, as it progresses through the groups and at the plenaries. Okay, thank you very much.